Well, it is 1 p.m., so we will get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today, for joining the Dragos team. My name is Kate Desma. I recently joined the Dragos team as Senior Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs. We're looking forward to engaging with you today. Just a few notes. Today's webinar is being recorded, and if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A function. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to our founder and CEO, Robert Lee. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, to uh, state the obvious, I'm uh, a little bit differently dressed than uh, when I was in front of the Senate. Uh, that's probably the first question I would get from anybody that knows me is, can they expect to see me in a suit more often? And the answer is no. Uh, I reserve suits explicitly for Senate testimony in Congress. Uh, and uh, so instead, I'm in a hotel today, which uh, tends to be the place that most of us in the industry live out of. So appreciate y'all's patience uh, with the decor and everything else and uh, looking forward to this. So um, I got flooded with questions over the years uh, about testifying to the Senate. Um, engaging public policy leaders, um, uh, sort of the conversations that take place, how it works, kind of the mechanics of it, et cetera. Uh, and I started getting flooded with a lot of questions after this latest uh, testimony, as well as just a, a massive amount of support, which I genuinely, genuinely appreciate. It's always really confidence inspiring that um, the, this community, especially in industrial and OT, um, it's just a good community of people that support each other generally. You know, everybody's going to have their one or two, but uh, for the most part, it's just a very, very uh, supportive community. So one, thank you. Um, but in that theme of everybody was super supportive and at the same time had a ton of questions, I thought it would just be um, better and probably more effective and efficient for everybody. I just throw up an hour long uh, meeting, no slides, nothing formal, just a very uh, uh, informal discussion while the webinar is recorded. Uh, your names and companies or whatever uh, in terms of submitting questions will not be. So uh, especially for those of uh, my energy company friends that do not like having your name and uh, company broadcast out as you ask important questions, don't worry, we, we won't. Um, but uh, I'm going to open up with just some statements about the testimony and kind of the points that I made. Uh, if you all could start lining up the questions that you might have, ranging from anything from the subject matter that was in the testimony, uh, testifying in general, engaging with policy uh, or just insights about the threats and vulnerabilities and things that was referenced in there. Uh, just go ahead and start lining those questions up uh, and I'll start filling the questions as soon as I'm done. Um, we will run this until there's no more questions. So if y'all don't have questions, uh, we'll, we'll end early. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, given given the initial response and so forth, I think we'll have some, some pretty good ones. Um, so uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, yeah, as mentioned, the founder and CEO over here uh, at Dragos, uh, we're an industrial cybersecurity tech company. Um, but uh, before that, I uh, spent most of my career uh, on the Air Force side of the house, uh, serving over in the National Security Agency, uh, where I built out the U.S. government's mission looking at state actors breaking into industrial sites of the world. So it's been really interesting over my career to see the landscape shift from there are no such thing as industrial control system threats, or actually it was started with what are industrial control systems uh, and kind of like the security discussions then it morphed to, well, we need to focus just on the legacy stuff and vulnerabilities, but let's be real, there's no such thing as ICS threats. And we tried to prove differently um, and show, and then eventually got really good at showing, unfortunately, um, on the agency side of the house. And then it morphed into, okay, there are threats. We need to start doing better security. And that morphed into, oh, well, there should be OT-specific security. And, and it's just been an interesting evolution uh, of, of uh, the community in, in my short time doing it, right? And and so uh, it's been it's been interesting to say the least. Um, but what's probably filled me with a lot of pride is also the work over the SANS Institute, where I still teach and, and author the uh, Instant Response Network Monitoring class for ICS, and uh, seeing just the massive amount of community members uh, that have taken that training or people that have crossed into ICS security. And I would say that while the material in the testimony is intense talking about threats and critical national infrastructure and national security risks. The very, very positive aspect is this is a community that continues to invest in the problems. It's a community that knows how to get things done. And we have seen just a massive influx of people joining the ICS security community and companies focusing on it uh, in a way that nobody would have really predicted, you know, a decade ago. Um, so the testimony itself, um, essentially uh, from a process standpoint, I'm sure other companies can do it differently or other people can do it differently. Um, but Drago's stance is not to like go um, sort of 
proactively uh, seek out things. Usually we don't, we don't go and sort of insert ourselves in the conversation. I, I think people should be really careful about that when you're at a company. Um, you don't want, I assume maybe some people do. I don't want uh, Dragos to be inserting itself into conversations that may turn into things like regulation or um, requirements on the infrastructure community. The infrastructure community should be speaking for itself. Uh, cybersecurity vendors, especially ones that have a, a, a bias and that they want to be able to deliver their technology to do these kind of answers, you need to be really careful uh, about getting involved in public policy. Um, you need to be really thoughtful. So our stance is usually just, they know who we are. We put out interesting research and, and, and uh, insights. We're pretty transparent and candid. If if they want, they can call us and we'll help them out. And, and so pretty often on down the hill, um, usually with staffers or other folks, uh, it started out years ago as here's how the power grid works. You know, there's not just one and there's transmission, distribution and, and uh, uh, generation. And hey, when you talk about energy, it's actually a lot more. You know, it, it was started out almost just explaining the industry. And then over the years, it got into really, really well informed um, uh, conversations. I've been incredibly impressed with the congressional staffers uh, and the expertise they've developed on this. If you think about it from a, a congressman standpoint or congresswoman standpoint, uh, they have to be on so many committees and cover so many topics that it's easy to kind of poke at them every now and then, but it is impossible for them to be expert on anything. Uh, and so the staffers carry a lot of that weight to really uh, investigate and then get insights and gain expertise and, and go have these conversations. So the, the way this Senate testimony came out is I got a call from uh, one of the Senate staff uh, members. They knew my name, they, they have interacted with me before, uh, and, and actually that individual, I, I've gotten to know quite well uh, because he was the one that invited me to the last time that I testified in 2018. And so uh, he called me up and said, look, it's been five years. Uh, we are having a, a hearing on cybersecurity for the energy sector. We'd love to have your perspective on what's changed in the last five years. Uh, and it's going to be kind of a unique panel because sometimes you'll have like all government representatives or all industry representatives or or whatever. And this one was a really well-crafted panel where he had a representative from the Department of Energy, which was uh, Director uh, Kumar Piyush. Uh, and then you had um, Steve, uh, who is over, he's the Chief Security Officer over at AEP. Uh, and then you had me representing a uh, cybersecurity kind of uh, tech vendor. So you had a combination of a vendor, an asset owner, and a government representative all being able to field these questions for the Senate, which is bold, but good. Why is that bold? Because when you're a government representative, it, it you know, you can get beat up on pretty quickly. Uh, and I think a lot of us saw that uh, in the testimony. Uh, I thought the senators all were great. I thought the questions were great. But obviously, there were some hard-hitting questions that were getting thrown to, to Piyush. Uh, and so usually they try to have those kind of conversations, at least with pure government agencies. But because of the topic, because we all kind of know each other, because um, uh, the significance of it and the fact that this isn't something that like government is going to solve, uh, they decided to have kind of this three pronged approach with the panel, which I thought worked out really, really well. Uh, and I was a big fan of kind of how it how it flowed. Uh, and so that's kind of how it came about. It was just kind of a random phone call. I found out. Uh, that I was going to be testifying uh, a couple of days before, uh, and I think it was like the, the end of the week before, and then wrote the testimony. So uh, essentially, you write a written testimony, which is the encompassing of kind of all that you really want to be able to say, and then you condense it down to a, a five minute or less um, sort of verbal testimony. And so if you watch the hearing, the written testimony is much more encompassing on, on the thoughts uh, that I had, but the verbal testimony gets to the points, uh, which I'll cover here in a second. And then, uh, of course, the questions and answers uh, the, are usually informed by the testimonies. The testimonies get submitted two to three days. I think it's usually two before the hearing. Uh, and, uh, and then the staffers go through it all and, and write questions for the senators and, and prepare them. Uh, and so it ends up being a really good process. Like I've just, I've been in awe of it. And I think many Americans uh, or folks that are not even in this country uh, would appreciate that politics have been pretty divisive over the past couple of years and pretty partisan. And regardless of whose side you're on, you look internally and it's kind of dismay at some point, especially if you view it through the media and, and kind of uh, those conversations. It's pretty quick to get disheartened about some of the things that you see. We, we, we all want our families and our kids and everything else to be taken care of. So the idea that people aren't um, working together uh, to solve these issues is always disheartening. Um, but the reality is 
there's a lot more that happens and a lot of, of good work and a lot of bipartisanship that just doesn't get the media attention as much. In the same way that every time one of our customers stops a cyber attack, you know, they don't get in the New York Times for that. Ah, power company invested really well, did amazing and kept the lights on. You know, it's not going to be the headline. Um, and so you don't, you just don't get credit for that stuff. Um, but I will tell you that um, it, it has filled me with immense pride to be able to go and testify to America's representatives representing all, all of these folks. And it's just, uh, it's, it's really cool process to get involved in. So anyways, let me transition to kind of the main points of the testimony, just to jog everyone's memory and, and open up dialogue. And like I said, we'll jump right into questions. Um, so for me, point number one is really around and what my intent there was really trying to enforce the discussion around OT. You know, there have been a lot of companies and a lot of governments that have invested a lot in cybersecurity of critical infrastructure. But 98, 95, 98% of those investments have gone to enterprise IT. And it was with good intentions. Um, but the critical part of critical infrastructure is OT. And the fact that those operations and technology systems, those industrial control systems, the fact that that dialogue has not really um, been elevated or hadn't been a couple of years ago, uh, is, is scary. And uh, there's board, you know, I very often go brief at board of directors member uh, meetings and it is not uncommon for a board member or even the CEO to sort of pull me aside and go, see, we're doing all these amazing things. I'm like, okay, do you know what you're getting for it? Like, do you, can you understand this? Or are you just excited? There's kind of green KPIs, you know, like what, and more importantly, is it the enterprise or is it enterprise IT? Because the slide's always, oh, from enterprise IT, here's what we're doing. And I had a, a very well-known CEO uh, ask me this and we were in the boardroom and I challenged and I said, well, you know, you guys are doing amazing work, but enterprise or enterprise IT? And he's like, what are you talking about? Of course, it's over the entire enterprise. And the CSO is like, um, no, 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 I only talk about enterprise IT. I don't talk about this OT stuff that's not uh, in our, our uh, gambit, it's on our lane, if you will. Uh, and the CEO's eyes just whew, like realized that all these investments that they're making weren't on the revenue generating part of the company. Uh, and it wasn't on the part that makes critical safe infrastructure. Uh, and there's environmental impacts and safety issues and things that can take place in these attacks. And so there's a lot of CEOs, boards, prime ministers, uh, national security council members, et cetera, that over the past couple of years have really learned that the critical part of critical infrastructure is not being done um, by everybody. Some companies doing quite quite a lot. Uh, and so that first point was really, hey, there's an industrial cyber threat landscape. Talked about it last time. I, I mentioned that we shouldn't be freaking out. You know, you always get that question as a cybersecurity professional by folks. They go, what keeps you up at night? And you know, back in 2018, when I had asked that question, I was like, not a lot. Like, look, we've got a lot of work to do. But our infrastructure providers, the asset owners and operators, they have just really put a lot of work into making sure we have a reliable and safe system. I didn't necessarily design security in, necessarily, you know, always thinking about security, but they build safe and reliable infrastructure and they care about the communities. And so that safety focus and that reliability focus has contributed significantly to cybersecurity, whether or not it was intentional. So in 2018, my answer was, hey, don't freak out, but the industry is going to change. We're going to get to this place where we're much more homogenous. It's going to get common operating systems, common protocols, common network stacks, common software that's embedded in controllers. And we're going to start seeing attacks at scale. Uh, we're going to start seeing an adversary not invest just to go after one facility. We'll be able to invest to make a capability they could reuse cross industry. And when that happens, we're in a very different place and we need to, we need to take that very seriously. And so that was the 2018. So the 2023 one update on that was, yeah, here's what's changed. Uh, what I would mention before came true, got pipe dream. Uh, here's what we know about it. Uh, and the thing that we don't want to do is hype it up, but we don't want to under uh, acknowledge the risk. And if you look at the risk, you have an attack framework uh, that an adversary has developed, a state actor has developed to be able to go against any different industrial industry, so it's cross industry, reusable. It's not something with just like exploits and patching and whatever and vulnerabilities. Like it's it's put a big focus on you need to be able to detect and respond um, to these things, not just try to prevent it. And 
uh, it's a pretty good signal that strategic state adversaries are going to continue to invest in going after OT infrastructure. We've never been in a place where we had a reusable cross-industry attack framework that can do physical damage and disruption. Just never been in that place. So we need to, we need to acknowledge that and, and think very seriously about what we do next, which then led to the second point, um, which for me was stop investing in things that don't work and start investing in things that do. Uh, and we have really good examples of things that don't work well, and we have really good examples of things that have worked really well. And, and it was understandable. And so that, that second point can come off pretty harsh um, as I get into the details here for in a second, but it's not intended to. Um, when we're, this isn't, your baby's not pretty, this isn't, your efforts are in vain. This is, hey, we're talking about people, life, safety, national security, let's have adult conversations, let's pick answers that are gonna work. And, um, when, when people may have invested in those things in the beginning, it was probably with good intention and good reasoning. But as we've learned lessons, let's adapt them. Um, I think anybody that's been around certain government circles uh, understands that usually when like a program is created, even if it ends up not being very successful, like it's hard to kill those things. And a lot of money, time and resources get wasted almost over uh, a, a fear to talk about failure. Um, but that failure causes lessons learned and insights and super useful. And the example I gave, which I'm sure uh, made me some, some uh, uh, enemies, uh, was I, I mentioned that there's a lot of money that goes to national labs to invest in trying to make new cybersecurity technologies. And I'm not talking co-development, I'm not talking grants, I'm not talking um, those things. There's a lot of great research, but a lot of like tech development to do tech transfer to the private sector. And all the projects that come out are like science projects or repeats of things in the industry. A good example, Dragos makes technology that identifies assets, understands industrial security protocols, identifies vulnerabilities and threats inside of those ICS networks. Great. When we started, there was like 20 competitors doing this. We're down now to like three or four um, that are out there and the really there's like two big ones, right? And, and yet there's still new investment, new taxpayer dollars, going into investing in making technologies to identify attacks in industrial networks or to analyze protocols to identify assets it's like guys what are you what are you doing like this we solved like we got it we, we we did it in the private sector we did it with capital funding don't use taxpayer money on things that they don't need uh, and the things that aren't working and so i pointed out a pretty harsh statement which was i've asked around i've i've you know, I sit on an advisory board at the DOE, I, I, at the Department of Energy. I, I, I'm in depth in these conversations. Name me one cybersecurity technology that wasn't dupl duplicative with what was in the private sector already that's still being used. That's actually useful and novel, and people are being, it's being used widely, or it's been sustainable, or uh, 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 really taken and run with. Well, define it however you want. Define success a lot of different ways. I'll give you an open gambit an open aperture here, but show me. And there's none, uh, none that I'm aware of in the last 20 years. Um, but either way, even if there was one or something, it would, it's minimal in comparison to the amount of investment that goes there. But those people, those national labs and their capabilities, wow, amazing. And they do amazing things. So let's take those resources. I'm not saying don't fund them, take the same budget, but reallocate where we're focusing. Stop focusing on things that don't work. Let's look at how we fund uh, the Department of Energy to actually, uh, this ties into point three a little bit, but I was like, let's talk about how we fund the, uh, fund the Department of Energy, where the Department of Energy right now is still developing new and interesting research and tech for green energy and electric vehicles and distributed energy resources and all these things and not building security into it. And there's no budget in those projects for cybersecurity investments. So we are still putting into place new greenfield kind of technologies that we're not applying any of the cybersecurity lessons that we go out and talk about. And I've kind of warned them privately as well as be careful being a hypocrite. You go out and tell power companies to do something and you're not doing it in your own federally owned power companies or you're not actually doing it in your federally re, uh, funded research projects and new, new technologies, you gotta be careful. You know, you can't just dictate to the, the companies to do something and not do it yourself. Um, and so, you know, you could take Caesar as an example, uh, uh, Pusha's office, and resource them to allow uh, uh, some level of authority over 
making sure that cybersecurity is getting done in these new projects, new research areas. You could have CISA. Uh, CISA has done a phenomenal job in a lot of things, but they're stretched thin and they should not be trying to do everything. But we could focus them on some national priorities, a couple of key areas and resource them, but internally really resource them and give them the authorities to hold the federal agencies accountable. Some federal agencies do a really good job. Some are atrocious on cybersecurity. So again, be careful uh, that we're not taking, uh, you know, federal regulations and going out and saying that a pipeline or a power company has to do something that a federal agency can't comply with themselves. Like just make sure that says it has the authorities to go take care of that. So it had nothing to do with don't give them resources. It has everything to do with get them the resources. That's fine, but focus them and let's actually solve some of these issues. Uh, and, and I also highlighted in general, one of the things that really, really works well, and we've seen work really well, is when there's a single voice of government, not every FBI field office, every military base, every, you know, three different sector specific agencies all coming and asking for two or three things and they're all misaligned. But when there's a single voice of government saying, here's what we want you to do and why. This is why we want you to do it. This is what the outcome is that we'd like. How is up to you. We've seen that happen. We saw that with the 100 action plan with the electric sector as an example, um, where government said, this is why we're concerned. This is what we need to be able to do. How you do it, private sector is up to you. Not dictating it, not suggesting it, not influencing it. You just do whatever you want. Uh, and all the CEOs got together and they did. And we saw massive increases in security across the electric sector, as well as more visibility across these operational environments. So we know it can work when government comes with why and what, but not how. And that's a policy policy position that I have and talk about in Australia and in Singapore and in the UK. It's not specific to the US. Um, why and what, not how. Let the asset owners and operators contribute to innovation and expertise that they have. Uh, and and then kind of I talked about point three a little bit with sort of the resource and the government, but at the same time, we also need to understand that the energy sector, and especially the power companies and some of the, the um, uh, natural gas companies, are so, so expert at what they do. Right? I'm not saying they're perfect at everything, but I'm saying like they really understand what they're doing. They want to work with government. They want to uh, focus on security. You got to set real requirements. You, you can't go to a power company and go, be cyber safe, be cyber secure. Like that's not a thing. Like what is it you actually want to do? An example I give in the, the testimony is, look, if, if a power company CEO was trying to invest against a scenario that's never happened, Let's say the threat is China, Russia, and Iran are going to team up, form a supergroup, and come at the power sector. It's unreasonable to expect them to be ready for that. It's unreasonable to try to invest in that because it's not happened. So even if you did invest, and even if it happened, it may be different than you thought it was going to be. It may have manifested in a different way, so what you invested in may not be effective. And you're putting a lot of costs on ratepayers, putting a lot of costs on you know American homes. Uh, to be able to invest in things that have not happened. And we don't even know if it's going to manifest in that way. So I think you could still do defense against it. But if that CEO is in front of Congress, I'll be right there with him. You know, like, yeah, they're okay. Like, wait, they did fine. Um, but if you're a power company and you don't have prevention, detection, response, and recovery capabilities in OT against the Ukraine 2015 scenario or the Ukraine 2016 scenario or the pipe dream scenario or ransomware across operations, stuff that's actually happened, not somebody gave a black hat talk, but real risk, real scenarios that have actually taken place in your industry. If they're not ready for that, they're way behind and probably ought to be legally liable on some of that risk because it's risk outside the fence line on people, not just your company. So basically identify the difference between business risk and community risk. And if they're community risk items, openly talk about them of, hey, power companies, Here's the risk scenarios that the government cares about. Here's the information we have about them. Here's what we'd like you to be able to accomplish. However you want to do it, please go accomplish it. You'll get a good response. And we've seen it work really, really well. So my, my kind of key point at the end was when you talk about energy companies, especially the electric power companies in the United States, especially the, the larger ones, realize they're already extremely heavily regulated. We're operating the electric system in a way it was never designed. We're doing it to, to chase for the lowest possible rates. Uh, we're adding a ton of complexity and it's all happening as national level adversaries are, are trying to poke and prod and figure out ways to take it down. 
So it's almost like, a, hey, have a little respect. <laughs> okay, like, let's not talk about these companies. Like, they're not doing a lot. Let's just try to focus on them. Tell me what the scenarios are and let's, let's figure it out. But if it's just, here's a regulation or here's a framework, that's a bingo card. What we should do is figure out the scenarios, figure out the right answer, and then map it to NIST, map it to 6043, map it to NERC, map it to whatever. Um, as a language, as a common lexicon, it's like MITRE ATT&CK, it's just a language. But what you actually do, you keep doing what you were doing before, or, or you identify these scenarios and do the right things against them, but just map it. Uh, to a common language. And that was sort of my push to the government because a lot of times the government insights, um, as much as the, the individuals in the government do an amazing job, they can be very confusing. And one of the big strategic risks for some areas of government is you'll have people writing regulation or informing policy or working on these issues or talking publicly about them that have never actually worked in the community, hadn't done industrial security or hadn't been in power companies or whatever. And so it's, it, it's hard when the, the regulator uh, has more, has less insights than the regulated, and um, that can be very difficult and very challenging. And so we just kind of have to acknowledge that. Now, there, don't get me wrong, there's a ton of amazing regulators and folks out there that have expertise. I'm just saying as a whole in the government, that is an issue that we have. So let's think about how we address it. So anyways, long story short, on, on my points, the industrial threat landscape had changed, especially because of pipe dream, but it was predictable in many ways. Uh, we have to understand that we need to pick things that work and let's go, but stop doing things that don't. Patching is an easy example. Some patching is okay, but people walk into these industrial environments and go, oh, they're old and legacy and vulnerable. Okay, where's the attacks that are using known ICS vulnerabilities? Because I haven't seen it. Uh, and we find that about 4% of the vulnerabilities out there are really meaningful and you've got to address them. So you do have to take care of them, but it's like 4%. And yet we complain about the 96. Why are we yelling at people to waste resources on things that aren't adding value when we've got a lot of other things to do? And then that third point, again, um, making sure that we have the government really identify what it wants the private sector to do and make sure that's a conversation with the private sector, not speaking at them. And then let's go figure out those scenarios and get it done. Um, for more insights, and I'm going to open up to questions now, but for more insights on some of the like readings uh, that might be helpful to you, um, number one, and I'll have uh, Joanne on our team, will post these links. Um, number one, uh, if you're just getting started in industrial security and you're just super curious about how to get started, um, I wrote a blog years ago and I updated it about once a year uh, with um, free resources and videos and training classes and things like that on getting started in ICS security. So come on in. The water's warm, right? The, the community's great. We, we want more people. Um, so that first link will be for the folks that are interested in learning more about getting into ICS security and want the resources and free free resources to do so. Uh, the second one, uh, if you're interested in the specifics around threats and vulnerabilities, I'm happy to answer questions a day on it. Um, but all the specifics in the testimony and the things behind them uh, are captured every year in our year in review report. Um, so we'll post the link for the year in review as well, which is what's actually happening out in assessments and, and tracking threats and vulnerability analysis and so forth. Uh, the third. Um, is is a piece of research that I'm really, really proud of. Uh, Tim Conway and I uh, wrote a paper titled The Five Critical Controls uh, for ICS Security. And what we did is we looked at all those different scenarios. We, we said, what are all the attacks that have happened in industrial sectors? Let's look at all the different scenarios. Let's analyze each step of all those attacks against something like the ICS cyber kill chain. And then think about the answers, the security controls that would have been the most impactful. And then what are the couple ones? Let's not peanut butter spread this issue. Let's not throw 20, 30 controls that people have to do. What's a couple? And we, we found five. And it really lays out sort of a strategy, not just prescriptive answers, but pretty strong strategy about how to think through what right security looks like at your, your company. And the five controls that I think everybody should be doing based on what we've actually seen in the attacks. So we'll post that paper. Uh, and then I didn't have Joanne prepare this one, but I'm sure she can find it. Um, if you're interested in just this topic of scenarios, going to keep talking about that. I wrote a, a blog over the World Economic Forum uh, on uh, scenarios and learning from the safety community. Because a lot of the scenarios really, what I'm saying is learn from the engineering community, right? Learn from um, the, the safety community. We, the safety community does things like process hazard analysis or has ops to to understand what are the scenarios that could cause unsafe conditions and then how do we design preventative and detective controls and responsive controls against it. Holy crap, that's just, that's kill chain analysis stuff. It's, it's 
spot on with what we need to be doing in cybersecurity. So go learn from what they do, translate cybersecurity, and here's what that can be. Here's what that can look like. Um, and so that was that blog. Um, so those are some resources that will be in, in the uh, link or shared after the webinar with everybody. Um, hopefully those are useful to you. But let's go ahead and jump in and uh, start doing the questions for the remaining time. So, Kate, what do we got? Uh, here's, here's one for you. Um, and I think this relates to uh, what you were talking about as cyber risk as a business risk. Uh, we are briefing our board of directors on cybersecurity and including your testimony. Is there anything beyond your main three points in the testimony that you think would be useful for a board of directors to know? We explain what systems make money OT and systems that support business IT and clarify how security is applied. Yeah, um, great question. So uh, I would say there's really, there's just a couple big takeaways for a board because um, you don't want to flood them with too much information. Uh, number one, they do need to understand their business. <laughs> That's basic, right? If you are a CEO, CFO, COO, board member, you gotta know how your business makes money and you gotta understand what is its impact on the community and how can we be good community members, right? So educating them on what OT systems are and why OT cybersecurity is different than IT cybersecurity, that, that's always a good use of time. Um, and you usually do it through threat scenario kind of case studies. Um, but the second one and the most important for boards are those scenarios. Um, boards can get a, a lot of board members I talk to and a lot of uh, executives I talk to get kind of beat up on cybersecurity. They know they're not allowed to say some of the things they want to ask. You know, like, why are we really doing this? Hey, I, I don't see any return on investment from this. How much is enough? Do we just keep doing cybersecurity until we run ourselves out of business? Right. I mean, there's almost not angry, but almost just pushback questions. And, and it's very reasonable. And cybersecurity community members sometimes get in front of boards and here's my KPIs and here's the NIST cybersecurity framework and here's the greens and we did this assessment with C2M2 and this is what this means. And that's not, it gets, it can be helpful depending on your board, but oftentimes it's missing the point. Boards speak in the language of scenarios, whether we're talking about gap revenue accounting or we're talking about litigation and regulatory scenarios that may form, or we're talking about uh, forecasting strategic initiatives in the company for acquisitions and the scenarios that would lead to us thinking about whether it was a good investment or not. They already deal in scenarios and your engineering leaders already deal in scenarios and root cause analysis and safety and so forth. So by speaking in their language and bringing it up to here are the scenarios we care about, not we want to go patch these systems because there's this new attack that came out ooh, and um, NIST said we should. Oh, that's, that's wrong. It should be, hey, here's the scenario that actually happened in our industry. It poses real risk to our company. Do we want to accept this risk? Yes or no. And if the answer is no, we want to mitigate the risk. Here is the package that is appropriate for it. Don't nickel and dime it. Don't try to get into articulating the controls. It's this is the package. You hired us to know how to do cybersecurity. What we need to know from you is what are your priorities? Which scenarios and against what sites? You know, what 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 assets do we own as a company? And do a risk, you know, high, medium, low risk, ABC kind of profile. And do we want all of the high risk assets to be the four scenarios that have happened in our industry and two from a peer industry uh, to be proactive? We want our B sites to just cover the two biggest ones and our C sites, you know, low risk sites just cover one, you know, what is it that you want us to do? So the board is really responsible with the uh, management team to understand the requirements. So if you can speak in the language of scenarios and have them guide you on which scenarios do you want and uh, what sites are critical. Uh, th those are the things that are gonna be a good use of time and, and, and be something that they can then feel tangible about. You know, that's probably the number one pushback I get from board members is like, dude, a lot of this stuff just doesn't feel tangible. I don't know if the investment worked or not besides like pen testing and red teaming things, I, I should know. Um, but if you actually can articulate the scenario and go, yeah, we feel really confident that if this scenario were to happen, we have the right preventative, detective and response controls in place that we know how to respond. We can reverse engineer the incident and feel good about the data and insights that we're going to be uh, delivering to a board level for regulatory litigation, operations, security, finance, et cetera. We feel comfortable now with this one. And, and that is something that's a lot more tangible than I think what people put in front of them normally. Cool. Excellent. We have another question. From a SIP perspective, for especially electric utilities, what's the greatest threat in your opinion? 
disgruntled employees, state actors, rogue actors like Hacker Collective, smart grid implementations that have opened up skated to IP compliant protocols. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to uh, NERC SIP, uh, bulk electric system regulated assets, I think the answer is going to be very similar anyways for others. But uh, when, we, when we look at those assets, I don't usually cluster the threats into what's more important, state actor or insider or this or that. I think it's a very reasonable question. I just, I just generally don't um, uh, personally. Uh, what I think about, obviously, I go back to those scenarios. Uh, and I think you can pull from insider, you can pull from activists, you can pull from state, whatever, uh, in terms of having those scenarios. And to kind of build on that scenario point, what I think is really important for companies to understand is what is business risk and what is community risk. And it's not on the board of directors to be able to accept risk on behalf of the community. And so if you find a scenario from an insider that is going to cause community risk, like, an, like a state actor, and it's a real scenario, then you got to look at addressing it. Um, so I'd prioritize off of what's actually happened, those scenarios, and prioritize on community risk. If you've got a power company that doesn't want to implement multi-factor authentication in their IT networks, and the consequence is going to be stolen data uh, and, and, and insights, that's honestly that company's choice. It might, we might think it's a bad choice, but it doesn't matter. It's their choice because it's business risk. But if you're talking about a generation facility that has a safety system because of the type of generation it's doing, and uh, an issue or cyber attack against that safety system uh, in a scenario that we've seen before, like the Trisis scenario, would lead to 30 people nearby outside the fence line dying and uh, potentially, you know, 20, 30, 40 people at a hospital uh, because of the lack of power dying um, uh, and so forth. It's not on the company to be able to say, nah, we accept that risk. Sorry, that's community risk. You, you've got to address that now. So that's not your company's uh, choice. Anyways, so find those, and whether they're insider state or whatever, I wouldn't be too bothered by it. Now, I don't really, just to answer your question a little bit more directly, I'm not worried about the hacktivists, I'm not worried about kind of the collectives. Um, what, I'm, what I think is a realistic threat is state actors and insiders. Uh, and the beauty about that is a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, at least on the detection response, not necessarily the prevention one, but in the detection response side, addresses both. We're, we're not looking just for exploits and vulnerabilities. We're looking for behaviors, tactics and techniques and procedures. How would you manipulate the logic on a controller to uh, damage a circuit breaker? How would you, uh, uh, you know, leverage the HMI and engineer workstation to cause effects to take down the facility, right? Like those things happen across this system of systems and detecting somebody doing that, whether they're an insider, or a state actor, a lot of it is very overlapping. Um, so singular investments can have dual uh, outcomes for you. Excellent, here is the next question. I saw the EPA sanitary survey mandate published on March 3rd. Are we going to see more regulations for other critical infrastructure areas? And what do you think those will look like? Yeah, um, so I don't know. I'm gonna give you the, my answer, but it's not an informed like, I'm talking to regulators and they're telling me what's coming, right? There's no insider knowledge here. Um, but in my opinion, you're going to see a lot more regulation uh, and specifically a lot focusing on OT uh, worldwide. I don't want that. I don't think that's the right answer. Uh, I think that singular voice, communicating about scenarios, all those things, you should try that first. Um, but the reality is now that policy leaders and everybody else understand that the critical part of critical infrastructure wasn't getting addressed, they're looking at the private sector going, hurry up, do something. And if they don't, they're going to go, time's up, and they're going to regulate it. And they're going to regulate it for a lot of reasons, but one very obvious and simple reason is the uh, people that elect them into those positions do not, would not allow them to say, oh, yeah, we just didn't really want to address that issue. Uh, they're not going to get reelected. So for Congress, it's, and the regulators, their tool is regulation. And if the answer is not fixed by the community, they'll use that tool. And there are some communities that I think are close enough uh, together and connected that they can have community discussions and move in the right direction. I think electric power, uh, I think there's a lot of that. But there's still plenty of companies that are like, nah, I don't really care, we're not going to do it. And those will be the ones that get called into question and, and bring about uh, regulation for everybody else. And then there's also other communities that aren't as well connected. And they don't all coordinate and talk as much and uh, not having a single voice back to government 
causes confusion uh, and I think there'll be regulation. So, yeah, I unfortunately think we'll see a significant amount more of regulatory um, uh, deliberation and, and, and regulations, especially trying to address the OT security issues. Uh, I'm concerned that we'll see a lot of copy and pasting of IT security into those. I'm concerned that the regulators are some of the regulators may not bring in people with the appropriate expertise on what would be useful, but instead just solicit almost survey style. Uh, and I'm concerned that the regulatory regimes that will get put in place will be overly prescriptive, very difficult to comply with, not enhance security all that much, um, but be extraordinarily costly. Um, so I, I would expect that we will see more NERC SIP like regulations to answer your question on EPA. I actually think that'd probably be a good outcome because of the way the community does with FERC and NERC and kind of the committees and the way that they approach the problem. I hope we don't see anything again like TSSD2, but TSD2C was really well done uh, and, and directionally accurate. And we may see more things like that as well. Um, the, the, what was directly, directionally accurate about it, it was, it was attempting to be more performance-based on here's the kinds of things you need to accomplish. However you accomplish it, it's up to you. And then that's exactly the right way to go. It's just harder to audit it. So a lot of regulations get written for auditors, not for outcomes. And we just need to be mindful of that. Uh, here's your next question. Um, what are your thoughts on the threat concerns regarding distributed energy systems? Seems like a lot is not available in terms of evidence other than recognition that there are concerns with integration of distributed energy resources mm -hmm. to the grid but that's an inev inevitable reality yeah yeah so look distributed energy resources evs uh, and similar i'm just going to kind of bunch all that together and say that lower cost assets generally have less budget assigned to them to do other things like cybersecurity because the margins are already pretty tight. So there are some large wind farms as an example, and some people are investing in them. There's also a lot of small ones and uh, impactful ones as a collective that nobody's doing anything in. Uh, and, and so the cheaper the asset, usually the less resources for cybersecurity. And we're depending more and more on these assets and the interconnectivity of the, them is posing real risk. Um, you have a lot of wind and solar farms this, and battery farms in this country, as an example, that have contracts where the vendor says, we'll remote in three times a week at max for maintenance and diagnostics, and it'll be from these five dedicated IP addresses. And then we get in there, turn on the technology, look at kind of it from a visibility perspective, and see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of connections all the time, uh, and doing a lot more than just diagnostics. Uh, and what's happening is some of these vendors and original equipment manufacturers are are using them like research projects of well how can we learn more about operating wind farm to sell our next product better uh, but then they subcontract out to a lot of people uh, and so their intention is only oem x is going to access it but because of this the contracts and subcontracts and subcontracts and all their affiliates you may get 30 40 companies accessing that one wind farm unbeknownst to the asset owner and a lot of them are not in this country so you have remote connections coming in from all over the world uh, into energy assets. So long story short, you have kind of an open playground, things that aren't really getting a lot of cyber screen investment. They're connected up to our energy system. They're becoming a larger portion of the generation portfolio. And the type of energy they're producing isn't producing inertia, right? So they're uh, an inverter-based resource. They're not spinning equipment. Um, which is really spinning equipment and inertia is really important for just grid stability. Uh, and so you look at it and go, you know what, there's not a lot of scenarios that are factual today about threats that have gone after these. There's some, but there's not a ton. But after we get through the obvious ones, go do the obvious ones, right? The Ukraine, the pipe dream, ransomware. After we get through that, we need to be proactive on these because this is obvious. Like this is an obvious one of, oh, Hyperconnected cheap assets, not good cybersecurity, connecting from around the world, connected into our energy system and becoming collectively a larger portion of that portfolio. Holy crap. That, that is, you don't need to be an expert to be like, uh, there's going to be some issues there. And so we need to think about, well, what would the consequence be? So since we don't have threats as much, there's some, but since we don't have as many threats to inform us to do defense, intelligence-driven defense, then looking at things like consequence-driven analysis is super important there. And that's where we see some really good programs like uh, cyber-informed engineering, consequence-driven uh, engin uh, engineering. Uh, we see uh, 
uh, sort of the, the national labs and, and Department of Energy investing and things like that. And then I highlighted that in the testimony and said some of those type of things we, we need to be doing a lot more, especially when we're trying to be proactive. Great. Here's another question for you. That super geeky ICS question. How is Pipe Dream able to work across platforms in a scalable way? That is very frightening. Yeah, so um, essentially what the developers of Pipe Dream did is they looked at all of the other ICS capabilities we've seen before and kind of took it as a best hits list and rolled their own, but making them better. So the east and so when you look at like a network, right, north and south is going in and out of a substation or generation site. A lot of people try to monitor there because they can't get into the operations environments. You need to get in the operations environments. Just watching who goes in and out of one door isn't very helpful. It's 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 helpful, but it isn't the focus. You need to look at who's inside the house. Uh, and that's east and west analysis, that uh, east west analysis of looking, you know, tapping a span port on a switch inside a generation facility, looking at the traffic moving from engineer workstations, standard controllers, and so forth, right? Anyways, I, I bring that up to say, um, PyDream looked at what Stuxnet did with east west manipulation between engineer workstation and controllers, took that, copied it, made it better. Uh, they looked at crash override or in destroyer and what they did with native functionality protocols like OPC. And they included an OPC module that was better than Pipe Dream. Uh, they looked at Trisis and how it had a, a, an implant on a controller and what it could modify on that controller, that safety system, if it, you could actually implant directly on the controller. And they made their own implant to be able to do it on the controllers. Uh, and then we were really worried for a long time in the community about the common software. Uh, one of our researchers uh, at Dragos for years has been raising the alarm on Codasys, saying, hey, Codasys provides a lot of functionality for people as a software uh, technology and protocol inside um, these controllers, but it's getting embedded everywhere. And there's some definite risk in doing that. And that was the fourth module, if you will, in Pipedream of perfectly capable of using Codasys uh, to interact with as if it was in its own engineer workstation crossing the controllers at Codasys. Well, guess what? Codasys is in thousands and tens of thousands of devices across hundreds and hundreds of ICS vendors. So they went after Modbus TCP, which is one of the most common protocols. They went after OPC, which is a cross industry protocol. They went after Codasys, which is embedded everywhere. And they did it by learning from all the things we've seen threats do before. So that's why it's cross industry. And that's why it's reusable um, because it's not relying on an exploiter vulnerability to do these things. It's relying on native functionality in these environments. And if you're doing the things that we've said you should be doing for the last five, 10 years, protocol aware analysis, understanding behaviors, who's modifying the logic under controllers and, and how, things like that. If you could do that already against the tactics and techniques that we've seen before, well, you're in a pretty good place because that's what they did. They just learned from the tactics and techniques of the past and made them better. So your detections and response plans and stuff would be pretty effective. But if you weren't doing that before, you are way behind. Like the community is essentially just diverged. We were always kind of like together, the highest performers and the lowest performers. Not, not separating us too much based on the risk profile. Now, if you were doing the things before, you were way, way in a good place. Uh, if you weren't, you were way, way, way behind just immediately. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big thing for the community. Uh, here's another question for you. You mentioned that having a red team or someone else emulating one of the threats that we actually expect uh, and then seeing how our systems and people do in the face of that is a wonderful endeavor. At what scale do you think these exercises should be conducted? I believe broad scale, think FEMA type cross domain operational exercises is where we should be heading. Who in that yeah. case should be leading the development of readiness exercises? Um, any, I'll give you the flip and answer. Any of the already established government agencies who claim to do that, <laughs> there's a bunch of them, um, but let me give you the, the, the more accurate answer. Uh, number one, pen testing and red teaming can serve many purposes. If you have to prove the risk or you have to prove there's connectivity or you need to prove something to internal people to get the resources to go do the problem, then pen testing and red teaming can be useful on the front end of your program. But usually if everyone's aligned, you want to get your technologies rolled out. You want to get the people in process in place. You want to build your program to a decent level, especially your crown jewel sites. And then you do the red team. So it's kind of on the back end of the program. Then you do the red teaming, emulating threats that we've seen before to validate 
technology placement and tuning, validate the people, evaluate the training they have. You're, you're testing everything overall, not is this vulnerability exploitable? Is, you know, can I pivot from IT to OT? Those, those are fine use cases for pen tests, but it's not as powerful as you could do with sort of an uh, overall program that's built. And then you get into kind of doing that on a regular basis, maybe even annually. Um, and, and it's a good exercise for folks. Um, in terms of cross-domain, yeah, we should look at things like GridX, um, which the electric sector has done extraordinarily well at, and it's a electric sector-wide uh, uh, scenarios that they throw out, and the company sort of tabletop exercise how to deal with this. Um, there are readiness and training and scenario planning offices in CISA and the White House and FEMA. There's a bunch of them. Uh, they all had to coordinate, probably with CISA taking the lead and figure out what are the ones that are most relative, relevant for each uh, sector, and let's go do a grid X-like thing in those sectors on those scenarios, and um, that'd be very helpful. Excellent, next question is, are you seeing similar need and attention to address security threats and risks with industrial IoT devices? No, and industrial IoT, I think, takes a very different flavor. Um, and so uh, there's not as many scenarios that are as relevant right now. That, that's more when you get to the proactive ones. So you kind of get through the obvious things and, and then focus there, kind of like we were talking, the wind farms and so forth. Um, so I'm not as concerned about that yet. Um, if you get through the threat-driven scenarios, then you can do more consequence analysis with that. Where IIoT, to me, is a potential risk um, is, number one, it's the connectivity aspect of it. So whether it's IIoT or a PLC itself, I don't really care. I just care, are you having remote connections out to cloud infrastructure and similar? It's okay, but it enhances your risk profile. And we need to look at that and what we're going to do about it. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, is that IIoT truly just diagnostics and data analysis, or is it inside of a control loop? Um, could modifying the IoT device itself modify the plant, modify the control functions? If so, that's not necessarily always a good design. Can we just design a better um, so, uh, sort of implementation? And, and then number three, I think about product security, where a lot of industrial security is not product security. They're not synonymous. In IT, because of the, the focus so much on systems, uh, we have a very system-heavy security viewpoint in IT industry. Uh, and if Microsoft, as an example, comes out with a really vulnerable operating system uh, update, it, it'll screw everybody over like globally and we all have to deal with it. And so product security matters a ton because system security and product security, that's your product, that's your, that's your system. So IT security is not the same thing as product security, but product security is a big part of IT security. Uh, and that Venn diagram is pretty close together. In OT security, it's systems of systems. What you do on any one device really is not important. And it doesn't even have to be exploits and vulnerabilities. If you know how to use an engineering workstation, system one, to modify the logic on a controller just natively, system two, where there's a physical manifestation and a valve, a pump, whatever, system three, that's bad. That's scary. Whether or not it's insider, state actor, malware, knowledge, whatever. And so it's about protecting the systems of systems. So IIoT is more of a product security discussion and that's not the same or even as close uh, to security as it might be in IT security. So I'd like the IIoT vendors to build in some basics and do that product security because that's what they can do and they should do. Um, but whether it's an IIoT device or a PLC, I just need us to think about the system of systems, the risk profiles, the connectivity, so forth, and think about the consequence and the scenarios we're solving. And if you do that, you, you won't be obsessing about IIoT too much. It'll be an important part of the discussion. It won't be the focus of the discussion. And here's another one for you. What regulations or best practices cover safety information systems? I don't see many vendors protecting this part of the OT network. Yeah, so safety instrumented systems or SIS, uh, there's a lot of standards. Uh, ISA has done a lot of work there uh, as well. Um, inside the United States, the Department of Home Security and Department of Energy invested with the oil and gas community years ago uh, to form the group Logic, L-O-G-I-I-C, where they put a lot of focus and research and effort into making more safe and secure SIS um, uh, environments. Um, so the, the safety focus, I actually think, has been pretty heavy. Uh, and the security of those devices, we're, we're seeing good traction. Um, but 
I would say most, you just kind of have to, I don't, I don't think most people know about it. Mm-hmm. And I think I'll go back to the, it's important to think about it in the system of systems context, not just the device security itself. Um, what I would think that we'll probably need to do though, I think the, the change that'll probably need to happen in the industry that'll be very useful, especially outside of energy or outside of uh, electric, I should say, uh, is back after Bhopal uh, disaster happened, the, the industrial accident, Bhopal, India, and it killed I think they claimed it's like 3,000 people, but I think all the studies would show it's closer to 30 or 40,000 people died. Um, that really woke up a lot of the industry around safety. And so it revolutionized like the safety community in the chemical industry and so forth. And prior, there was a lot of companies that if you're a plant manager, your bonus, your KPIs, your, your pay can be very closely tied to the margins and how much you produce at that generation facility, that chemical plant, the manufacturing site, et cetera. So anything that they spend out of their budget can actually negatively impact them. It just keeps them accountable. But companies were like, ah, I shouldn't do that for safety. So they removed, most companies removed safety work from the budget of the plant site and made it more of a corporate expense so it doesn't go against them so that nobody's incentivized to cut corners on safety. Not all cybersecurity contributes to safety. Actually, a lot of cybersecurity doesn't, no matter how much people want to say that stuff. But there's some where cybersecurity is a direct correlation and direct impact on safety. We should be able to identify those scenarios and the controls around them and remove that from the plant budget, remove it from the mining operator's budget, et cetera, make a corporate expense and, and, and have that as like a shared service uh, capability or model. Um, the moment that people were able to economically invest more without penalizing themselves against known scenarios with an understanded outcome that they're trying to achieve, yeah, you'll, you'll change things very, very quickly. Um, so I, I think that's probably one of the big investment areas. Um, Rob, I do want to let you know that we have only about five minutes left, so maybe one or two questions live. Yeah, happy to take any questions, but if there's any that are the policy side or the Senate testimony side or anything like that, let's elevate those ones up. Otherwise, whatever we got, we'll go with. Sure, excellent. Um, well, I think here's a really good overarching question. Um, what are the common vulnerabilities that have been exploited uh, and attacked? And what are the common attack vectors that you've seen that we're facing? Uh, common attack vectors usually remain, relate to like remote access uh, into these environments. I think a lot of people usually still think that like phishing emails and IT translates to like power outages and it, it doesn't, not, not traditionally. Like it can, I guess, but not as commonly. More commonly as adversaries just directly going to OT networks. The old school mindset was you have to go through IT to get to OT, so let's protect IT. But the reality is, even if an adversary does have to go through IT, it may not be your IT. Um, the direct interaction with vendors, integrators, maintenance professionals, contractors, OEMs, et cetera, there's so much access. Uh, and, and people that think they have an air gap, if you're not in the nuclear power industry, just save yourself the time, you don't. Uh, and, and those connect uh, connections are the attack vectors that we're seeing to get adversaries in. And then they're leveraging uh, native functionality, knowledge of the system of systems to achieve attacks or codifying the knowledge into malware. We are not seeing a bunch of exploits and vulnerabilities in the ICS networks. We're seeing adversaries use IT vulnerabilities to get into like a, a pulse secure gateway and then pivot into OT where they then start learning, living off the land, learning that native functionality and abusing it to achieve their effects. Great. Um, and here's one for you. How can hardware vendors help make their products more secure and defensible for ICS security? Um, if we're talking at a, a specifically at a hardware level, I'd say the first thing a lot of people want is just a bill of materials. Like what's in it? Where is it coming from? Tell us the subcomponents of it, et cetera, um, just so we can make accurate and, and informed risk decisions. Um, there, there's a lot of hardware specific security work that can happen it is not my focus area it is not my expertise and it's not been relevant to any of the cybersecurity discussions um, that i've seen there's a lot of like boogeyman stories oh well, there was a chip in the super micro servers no there wasn't or oh well that transformer that came uh, over from china uh, got intercepted by the doe because uh, there was back doors in it no there weren't and that's not what the, what actually happened and i was well involved in that one to understand what really happened and the stories that got told by people and even in the media from experts was alarming. Um, and so just don't hype up the problem, but go understand your real materials, your subcomponents and and do whatever you think is appropriate uh, for kind of some of the, the obvious scenarios, if you will, from a hardware standpoint. 
but I don't, I don't think there's that much correlation over uh, hardware-based attacks to do cybersecurity stuff. I, and I know you can come up with all the different scenarios. Tell me about it. And, and don't get me wrong. I've seen plenty of programs on the IT side that are interesting, um, but I'm talking on the OT side specifically. And uh, I, I don't know that I think that's a great investment of resources if you're doing it for remote cyber attacks. Um, if you're talking about hardware validation and making sure that your hardware is reliable and resilient and not having constant disk failures and having good subcomponents and components and build materials and things like that, that stuff is very useful for cybersecurity and for the asset owners. And I think the, those tend to be pretty good investments. Well, I think we are about out of time. So um, I'll let you wrap it up, Rob, but I just wanted to let the audience know that all the resources we referenced here today will be sent out as a follow-up. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, like I said, I'm always happy to field questions. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered, we'll, we'll take a look at all the questions we can get a blog out answering the questions. So just stay tuned and look for those. Um, thanks for all y'all do. You know, I know there's a lot of people on here from policy, government, uh, analysts and so forth, but there's also a lot of people from asset owner operator community and uh, kind of how I ended my testimony. I'll end it here. We got a lot of work to do. There are real risks, there are real threats, but we don't need to freak people out. We need to understand that if we come together and we identify the real requirements, we can do it. Like defense is doable. Uh, and this is a community that can rise to those challenges and has shown they have before. So if we get on the same page, we'll be okay. Um, so let's not freak out, but let's focus. And so thank you, everybody, and especially for those of you that are out in the field, uh, out actually at the asset owners and operators. Thanks for keeping the lights on. Thanks for keeping the, the fuel going. Uh, I know me and my kid <laughs> kind of appreciate that. I like having a uh, you know, modern society. Um, so just thanks for all the work y'all are doing and thanks for uh, tuning in today. Over to you, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Again, we'll uh, send out the uh, re resources reference as a follow-up. Thank you for joining us today.